Hello, good evening everyone, or I suppose afternoon, given how dark it is, it feels like evening. Um, the Canadian International Council acknowledges that Ottawa is built on the unceded and unsurrendered Algonquin and Anishinaabe territory. The peoples of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe nation have lived on this territory for millennia. The culture, their culture and presence have nurtured and continue to nurture this land. The CIC honors the peoples and land of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe nation, and the CIC honors all First Nation, Inuit, Métis, and all Indigenous peoples and their valuable past and present contributions to this land. Now, if you'll join me in welcoming Chief Disguise, Chief of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, uh, as he delivers the words before all else. And on and on again, go there as what to see you, going away, go a while down. Nay, and wait for canto, some way of this song, some go away, gonna hunt you. Nay, nay, always up scan out, do not, don't you? Nay, the night and way, hey, he here, Scott and Dwyer, and go on, you go up. Scott and Dwyer, no hunt you, need to get any up to go on, you go up. And on and the water, we say, oh, when's it? Do you know what did one who caught? Nay, to go home, go away, go home at one, so go away this up. Nay, go to go to home, get scan up, don't know, don't you? But one could not want you any on top, but on the no, no, or the hodoni, Cadin, yo, can you dine, yo, get hand in yo, oh, no more than yo. Nay, 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 can he go, nay, go to set to your wall on it. Nay, nay, and do the way you know me, that one horn you, and to gain your tongue, and go on the go up. And I know. On a hand wall through, it's a guy and a sound out a toy and the ox and go your dish. So, it's a guy and that guy when they are trapped and to a one's a gay. They got quest on it, quah, had he one other guess. It is so, did you know who quah? And they car, car, quah, guess, was getting get to go, what said the watcher, they said one home quah. So he car, and neat dog is, it is so, had neat dear to the home quah. They did not endure the way I know, neat dear to know, you know, they can't get up to go on the go. And on it on a hand wall through, we said, We'll go on, yes, can you die? Oh, we have one, a touch words up. Nay, does a high white one say, Noun sound go a hang or handle, how I shall be young. Nay, did it? And what do we know? Nay, the silver no, you know, said, We'll go on, yes, can you die? To get any up to go on, you go up. Danny on a hand wall through, we gain and go down, get her yoke, you know. Nay, gain it, you can't, you don't scan up, do not, don't you? I did not endure by your own, yet in on you. Gay, no good doggy, had your yak kernel, dear key and you know, that again you don't go on the go hot. Danny on a hand wall true, we hung hot, get gone, you the Hana, great Sangoya dis, made so to set up, made scan, I do not to you. I did not endure by your own, the Sadwan on you, gone here the Hana, great Sangoya dis, the gang you don't go on the go hot. And then I took my God Queenie, Ike, Ageagata, Gunohanya, Kadanito. So I just like to offer a little uh, interpretation to you. Um, each time we gather, we go through this um, speech and we give thanks. We give thanks for the people that have joined us today. They've gotten here safe and everybody's healthy. And then <clears throat> the crowd, we give thanks to that. We give thanks to everything that has been put on this earth for our benefit and for our use and our responsibility to to look after so we give thanks for that we give thanks for the weeds because there's medicines in there we give thanks to the strawberries they're the main one for the fruit um and they were the first ones that uh come out in the springtime or the summertime um, we give th thanks to the uh, animals, to the deer. He's the leader of the animals. And the eagle uh, is the leader of the birds. We give thanks to the waters, all the streams. They help things to grow. We give thanks to the trees. We use for firewood, you know, to heat our homes. Um, we give thanks to <clears throat> our sustenance. 
If we didn't have sustenance, we wouldn't survive. So we give thanks to that. And we give thanks to the winds because they came, come and they clear the air. <clears throat> so we give thanks to everything that he put here on earth. And then from there, we move up into, um, I guess, above the earth. So we give thanks to the thunders and their responsibility, their job to bring water, you know, to cleanse the earth, to make things grow. We give thanks to the sun for the role that they play in helping to grow and heat our bodies. We give thanks to the moon, the grandmother moon, and we give thanks to the stars. So then we finish that part and then we go to um, uh, Skanyadayu, Handsome Lake. And he was a messenger from our creator and he brought our religion and how we're supposed to be um, and how we're supposed to conduct ourselves and how we treat each other. So we give thanks to him for the message that he brought us and that we still follow that today. And from there, we go to the four beings and we give thanks to them for looking after us, looking out for us and guiding our minds um, so that we lead that right path. And he was the one, the four messengers is the one that come to Skanyadaya with that message from Singwayadisa on how we're supposed to be. So we give thanks to them for the role that they played. And then lastly, we give thanks to Sangwaya Dixon, our creator, who, um, who gave us all this to enjoy and to look after. And to respect and, I guess, speak for, you know, because, you know, they don't have a voice. So... Somebody has to speak for that natural world, and it it's all out there. It has a life. It has a spirit, and we have to look after that. So that's how we open everything. We close it the same way. We give thanks again at the end, and we close it, and um, that's it for now, I guess. Thank you very much, Chief Sky. Um, to explore the past, we have Professor Jolene Ricard uh, from Cornell University, who will explain the relevance of the original visit to Geneva in 1923. <coughs> Okay. Try again and have say go. Hello. Thank you very much for taking the time to be with us and hear our thoughts about this important moment in Haudenosaunee uh, history. I'm Jolene Rickard, and I actually have a PowerPoint that uh, I guess the machines aren't talking to each other yet, uh, but I know that uh, we have a limited amount of time this evening. Uh, the exhibition actually became an opportunity to be an emissary of sorts, in that the experience of Descahe, of going to Geneva initially in 1923, came after a long series of events of disappointments and interventions by the settler state of Canada in Haudenosaunee territories, specifically at the Six Nations community at Brantford or Oshwegan outside of just south of Toronto, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. And so several things led up to this intervention and the people in our communities did something that was called bundling a speaker, a leader. And so Descahe, Levi General, actually went to Geneva representing the entire Confederacy. 
And we need to think about his presence there as representing an entire people, not just a single person or a single voice. And so that moment in 1923 actually was about what I would call in the 20th century, that moment of rethinking Haudenosaunee sovereignty. Now, the word sovereignty could be understood from a strictly European monarchical perspective with hierarchy and a single leader. But the way in which indigenous people have embraced the concept of sovereignty is actually very different. And so the concept of sovereignty is actually something that is about self-determination. It's about our interest in uh, self-governance, but it's also about our interest in uh, uh, the, the way in which we understand our place in the world. And so I would argue that leaders in our community at that period of time felt they needed to be present or visible to um, uh, the condition of nation states. And they asserted themselves in this way and sought recognition at the League of Nations, which is the precursor to the formation of the United Nations, which has two locations, one in Geneva, one in New York City in the United States today. And so the... Um, let me just... Okay. okay, here we go. Okay. And so I and so the 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 idea of sending somebody from our communities to Geneva to the League of Nations at that moment in time is actually significant for a number of reasons. It really clarified that after nearly 500 years of contact, our people still maintained this notion that we're a distinct people and that we are seeking to be able to understand the world on our own terms. And one of those terms is through governance. And so it was actually through the efforts of Kenneth Deer, who is a Mohawk from the Ganawage community, who has been working at the international, international level for over 40 years who's actually created pathways along with his colleagues and mentees to create a space to acknowledge what happened in Geneva upon Descahe's arrival. So the exhibit is actually uh, facing outward. It was meant to communicate to the European audience, to an international audience, both allied, indigenous and non-indigenous, about this journey. It was placed uh, through 60 panels along Lake Geneva, uh, an outdoor exhibit, and it was up for three uh, weeks during the convening of the Emirates uh, this summer in Geneva. And so I just wanna talk for a moment about what an exhibit is and what an exhibit does. And this is based on an early um, uh, curatorial intervention I made at the National Museum of the American Indian, uh, which is of course one of the Smithsonian Museums. And with my colleague, Paul Chat Smith, we created installations that we called the colonization machine, which was the initial quest in the Americas or lust for gold, the actual impact or idea of ideological conversion, of uh, asking our peoples to give up our way of thinking, our way of understanding the world and accept another ideology. The role of violence in this contact. And also you could see hundreds of figurines in one of the panels. And those figurines actually represent pre-1492, which is indigenous peoples before contact and, as, and, with this, and within this panel, what we're acknowledging is that it was very difficult to establish a, establish a link from those figures to contemporary peoples. And so there was a massive genocide against their people that had taken place. And so when we think about the context of the experience of indigenous peoples and what uh, the general public 
or general publics may or may not understand about this experience, I think the exhibit had a lot of work to do because you have to meet the public on their terms. But what can an exhibit do? And I'll just share this thought with you that it's demonstrated that physical experiences, including emotional ones, help us form lasting memories. Solid memories with emotional valences are more likely to produce empathy. Empathy leads to action. For example, research has consistently shown that eliciting empathy for a single individual in need results in helping behavior. Exhibitions provide the opportunity to turn visitors' empathy to action and long-lasting memories that in turn promote action. And it's interesting because this evening, I think what we'll hear are the ongoing ripples of this uh, rekindling of this relationship between the collaborators that initially received Escaje in Geneva, the city of Geneva, as well as today, the uh, organization of DOSIP that has been uh, in play for over 50 years. And so it's ironic that the experience of working on the exhibit actually created another form of diplomatic exchange as we were going through the process of bringing together our uh, individual or, or uh, in the case of the city of Geneva, the Haudenosaunee External Relations Committee as representing the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and then DOSAP as representing uh, the support and advocacy for indigenous peoples globally. And so you can see there's a number of people that have been involved in actually producing the exhibit of which I'm grateful for their support and help. And you'll note uh, the work of um, Amber Adams, Paul Williams, and uh, our trusted translator, Augustin Leroy, uh, Rick Montour, Heather George, Steve Henhock, Waylon Wilson, uh, Mia McKee, and Dusty Bridges are all uh, people that uh, were intimately involved in helping to produce the exhibit. And so, the exhibit was divided into four conceptual areas. The first area was principles of the Haudenosaunee of which you saw a demonstration and experience of this tonight with uh, Discahe, Steve Jacobs. And then uh, we also looked at the history of uh, Discahe going to Geneva. We looked at uh, how this justice, it was denied. And then we also look to the future, which tonight we have uh, Dr. Lightfoot to take us there. And so uh, I think that uh, one of the most important pieces of the exhibit is that Descahe called for justice long, de long denied to an indigenous nation. His call carried to nations across all earth because the people and the city of Geneva, Switzerland supported the Haudenosaunee and quote Iroquois, because uh, our Swiss collaborators argued that the way in which the Haudenosaunee are legible in Europe is through the language of the Iroquois or Iroquois. And so today, of course, you know that we refer to ourselves collectively as the Haudenosaunee. And so, why was he bundled? It was because of the intervention of the uh, state, the settler state of Canada in Haudenosaunee territories that sought to uh, dismantle our traditional governance and put in place an elective system. And so this is a tension that exists throughout Haudenosaunee communities on both sides of the river today. And, uh, but actually this uh, references uh, a deeper root because it was actually the aggression of George Washington who the Cayuga or Gaikono referred to as Hunnit the Gaius or village burner uh, who enacted the Clinton Sullivan campaign against our people. And a key impact of this dislocated the Cayuga people 
Uh, and you could see an original map that is actually, you know, from uh, one of Corn it, that's actually part of Cornell's collection. And the red line represents the military march of which uh, literally hundreds of villages were burned and our people were then forcibly displaced, which resulted in the formation of the community at Oshwigan. And so, uh, so the deeper root of this is, you know, that initial disruption in our homelands, uh, which led to then a secondary disruption uh, in the Six Nations territory. And so this ongoing kind of, you know, um, uh, impact of dispossessions is at the core of what made the Haudenosaunee take a stand in 1923. And so uh, forced migration. And so, and so our leaders strategically decided to appeal to the Netherlands. They appealed to the Netherlands based on our understanding of that original agreement of the two row wampum. And so the Netherlands are actually receptive to our appeal to actually represent us at the League of Nations because we were asking to be recognized on our own terms as a nation and then as a state in order to be able to speak to ourselves at that period of time. And what we have to remember is that at that period of time, Canada had been recently admitted as a new country in the League of Nations. And so it's not as if uh, the Haudenosaunee, which is over 2000 years old in its own govern governmental formation was a newcomer. It was actually Canada that had its, uh, you know, was in very recent government, but it was picked up in this way. And so it's difficult at this point in time, I think, to adjust our thinking, to think about the possibility of the Haudenosaunee and all indigenous peoples as representing ourselves and as continuing to maintain our own governance. But that's the vision and that is the work that was occurring at this point in time with, by sending Descahe to Geneva. And so, as Haudenosaunee peoples, of course, we embody these ideas in wampum belts, and we could see the use of these um, powerful objects to make that uh, statement. And we gathered actually international allies in Ireland, Panama, Persia, and Estonia. And it was actually through a uh, backdoor kind of negotiation uh, from Canada to Great Britain that Great Britain applied pressure against these four nations to actually then deny the possibility that we could be recognized at the League of Nations at that period of time. So one thing is interesting about all of our ancestors is they kept meticulous records. And so there are amazing archives with documentation, as you could see, of all of this uh, correspondence. And so we could see it in also two languages and sometimes three, uh, Cayuga and Mohawk. And so after Descahe was not, Descahe Levi General was not able to speak on behalf of the Haudenosaunee at the League of Nations, he authored this appeal, the Red Man's Appeal for Justice. And it was actually this speech that he spoke, that he then began to speak on uh, throughout uh, not only Geneva, but Switzerland, and then throughout Europe with the support of the city of Geneva. And so although he was not allowed to be able to speak on the floor of the League of Nations, he actually turned his voice to the public in Europe. And he spent a number of months in Europe trying to get this message put forward. And he returned to the, actually he returned to the United States because he was identified today what we would think of as a terrorist by the Canadian state at that period of time. And so his family was harassed. And actually uh, Descahe returned in poor health and he stayed at my grandfather's home at Tuscarora. And it was there that actually the Canadian Mounties were sent 
in all of their amazing splendor and in their horses. And I recall my father and grandfather telling me the story of the Mounties riding back and forth in a menacing way in front of my grandfather's farm as a way to kind of, you know, make sure that Descahe was going to stay in place and he wasn't going to try to cause further disruption amongst the people. And so uh, he delivered something on the radio in, uh, in Rochester, and it was called Descahe's Last Speech. And we actually have the document that we think is Descahe's Last Speech, which is part of the exhibit and part of a website that's being built. And so this photograph is actually one of the most significant photographs of the exhi ex exhibition and documents this event. It's on Descah it's Descahe with his collaborators from the city of Geneva, uh, the mayor of Geneva. And so I'm going to move rather rapidly to be sure to provide opportunity for my colleagues to speak. And we provided a series of images that extended the diplomacy through for a hundred years that the Haudenosaunee have consistently been returning to Geneva to, to be in dialogue with uh, the officials there to keep that relationship alive. Uh, we touched upon things like the other sovereigntist actions that the Haudenosaunee made, which is of course the rejection of imposed citizenship the use of our own passports. Uh, we looked at uh, the organization, the Indian Defense League of America that continues to this day, that uh, advocates that we have the ability to move freely in our homelands, uh, that the border crossed us, and that we have the right to cross the border between both the United States and Canada. Uh, we looked at the impact of the Haudenosaunee at the UN. We were at the groundbreaking. Uh, we looked at the advocacy that was going on in the 1950s, uh, which is still about the Holloman track. And in today in our communities, there's a land back movement. And so we also thought it was very important to acknowledge the work of our colleagues, other indigenous peoples that were also fighting along with us for these rights for these past hundred years. And we provided a number of high points in this exhibit where this happened. And we'd like to thank uh, the folks at DOSEP for helping us to recall this history and for the use of their archive to do this. We noted our ongoing impact at the UN today where we have the honored position of providing the words before all else at the opening uh, every year. And then uh, we tried to update our understanding of our own history in that the dominant image that was used of the Skahe prior to uh, this exhibit was the uh, uh, um, image of Descahe in an eagle feather bonnet. Men of his generation used the eagle feather bonnet in order to be read as native because that was a visible sign that people understood. And so today we've reclaimed our own traditional uh, symbol, which of course is the gestoe, and that's the image that we put forward. And this really important image was reproduced in the delegation that accompanied the exhibit this summer. And I think this is you know, uh, a launching point for actually another lecture about the meaning and importance of this image at this point in time. It's about the continuity of our work. And so the, uh, the message that I take from these images is that the people in our communities maintain this understanding of our desire to be autonomous, to represent ourselves, to speak as nation, uh, or whatever the 21st century version of this is, and that we will continue this work. And we hope that this photograph becomes a marker and that we can make change in the next hundred years. Another significant uh, role of this exhibit was to begin to balance the representation of the role of women in our communities because none of this happens through an individual. What's important to remember is all of this work is done because it's about a community of people working together 
and that there's an important balance of power between a title holder and his clan mother. And so one of the most important uh, images in this exhibit is actually the, I believe, uh, the photograph of uh, Discusse's Steve Jacobs with his clan mother, Cl Carol Jacobs. One of the more difficult things in looking at our photographic and historic record was the absence of women in the historic record. And so this is work for us to be done. Another uh, important uh, dimension of this exhibit was to take that moment of resistance at Oka or Ganasatage and recognize that it was actually women that were protecting their land. It wasn't about male Mohawk militarism. And so um, I know that my colleagues today will speak to the importance of the diplomatic moment that was again uh, sparked and created in this work. And I thank them for this. And this um, panel, which uh, is part of the end of the exhibit, really looks at what is the status of indigenous peoples today in the UN. And I think that um, I'm gonna let Dr. Lightfoot take that on, but we have work to do. And so uh, here's a really positive image though of the delegation that uh, opened up another space of diplomacy for us in this relationship. And then uh, I, now you can, I hope you understand why I see the exhibit as a kind of emissary in creating a space for us to continue this dialogue of collaboration. And uh, one of the proudest moments for the Confederacy was that uh, the Haudenosaunee uh, Hiawatha Belt uh, flew for a moment uh, along with other, the other nation state flags in Geneva uh, this summer. So, yeah, thank you. I'm gonna try to do this delicately. There we go. Thank you very much for that wonderful presentation. Um, and now in honor of the present, the modern day Chief of the Sky will lead a presentation on the current day advocacy for international recognition in which he will discuss the July 2023 delegation of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy to the United Nations in Geneva. So no fancy PowerPoint here. Um, I mean, it's good. My PowerPoint. <clears throat> um, you know, it's like Jolene says, though, you know, this guy, <clears throat> he was, he was a catalyst for this, you know, he was our voice. He was bundled with that responsibility of uh, taking our voice to the League of Nations. And <clears throat> that was that was his job. And so and it's not just him. It's um with each chief title, or I should say with the 49 titles, there's 50 all together. With the 49 titles, that chief has four people that are standing with him. You know, there's the chief, the clan mother. The mothers, like Jolene says, hold that title. They're responsible for that. And they have that right to um, choose who's going to be their clan representative, their nation and clan representative, and she has that right to take him out too if he does wrong. So the females hold a significant part in our society, and I think that was one of the things that really 
stood out when the Scahi Levi general was in Geneva is because the women never had that role over there. And it was the women that helped to support him and fundraise for him while he was there. I mean, he spent 18 months there, you know, and Grand River was sending him money, but, you know, it's expensive. And it was the women, I think, that helped him because it's the women, you know, that stand up our leadership now. They're the ones that hold that title. So, and I just want to mention that, and there's a lot of other people that, besides the clan mother, there's two faith keepers, a male and a female, and then eat, the chief has um, a sub-chief, they call him, and his responsibility is to go, if the chief can't make it, to be eyes and ears, and to report back to that clan of what was discussed at that meeting. So you've got those five people that are taking care of that business, but then there's everyone else that, um, it's like you're born with it, right? It's, it's part of your blood, this fight, and uh, everyone is brought up that way, you know? You're taught to, you don't know what your fate is, right? You don't know what your fate is. You're not chosen as, when I was a little guy, I wasn't, my great-grandmother, she never says, well, you know, he's going to be the chief, the next chief, you know. But they raised all of our kids that way. And you're all raised with that, that belief and those values. So you don't know you don't know who's going to take on that role. So the, the mothers they raise all the kids that way. Because it's not up to that. Even though we say it's up to that clan mother that's making that choice, you know, it's still, I think, ruled by those four beings and Sangwaya Disso. And I don't think you'd want to go against that. So it's it's determined. Um, so <clears throat> 100 years ago and, you know, 2023, July, you know, you go there and just the generosity and the hospitality that the ship, that the city, the citizens, those, everybody that was involved, it was really overwhelming. Um, hard to describe. I mean, and it's that hospitality, you know, shown to the Haudenosaunee and all the indigenous peoples, you know, um, they've been a big um, advocate for us over there. Um, you know, and the impact that Levi had, you know, and the effect, I think, that his words had on the people there, um, you know, it still resonates today. Um, so the peace, the friendship, respect that this city has shown, um, the Haudenosaunee and all original peoples, it's a model for others to follow. And that's why in 2023, we presented the city with a replica similar to this one of the friendship belt. So it shows the native on one side and the non-native on the other, and they're joined in <clears throat> hands and arms. And that creates a friendship of peace, respect, and friendship amongst us. And if we need assistance from them, we tug on it. So we presented them a belt similar to this one. It's a glass bead. Um, we could not, at the time, get enough wampum in order to give them the real belt. So we are hoping that that's going to occur in 2024 so that we continue to build off of that 
off of that relationship with the city, you know, because that's what it's about. It's about a relationship. It's not, it is a treaty, but it's a relationship to live by. And relationship and support of each other. So in my vision, as being a member of HERT too, I hope to expand that, you know, and take it to the Swiss Confederacy and have this two-row, have this friendship with them. You know, we currently have that with the British Crown. We have it with the Netherlands, you know. But establishing that relationship with these other countries, because we are a nation. We are a nation of the world. Um, so United Nations, you know, um, they want to give us an NGO status. You know, we're a government, you know. The Haudenosaunee is a government. We have the great law, the Guyana Rehkoba. We have our constitution, our laws, you know. We have process and protocols for our leaders and the women. They have their roles. I discussed that earlier. So, <clears throat> well, <clears throat> they were uh, there in February. Leslie Norton made a statement on behalf of Canada. Um, and I'll read part of it here. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has said and repeated that no relationship is more important to Canada than the relationship with Indigenous peoples. We acknowledge the role that Canada played in the events that led to Chief Descahe never addressing the League of Nations, and we now deeply, and we are now deeply committed to doing better and help take up, down the obstacles that still exist. This is an encouraging statement that Leslie had um, put out. But it's more than just a denial of um, this guy not addressing the League of Nations. We got to remember why he went there in the first place. And part of the Red Man's Appeal for Justice, if you have not read that or seen that, in there it says, Discahe, Levi General was at the League of Nations seeking justice regarding the following. Recognition of their independent right of home rule. Appropriate indemnity for the said aggressions for the benefit of their injured nationals. A just accounting by the Imperial Government of Great Britain and the Dominion of Canada of the Six Nations Trust Funds and the interests thereon. Adequate provision to the right of recovery of the said funds and interests by the Six Nations. Freedom of transit for Six Nations across Canadian territory to and from international waters. Protection for the Six Nations hereafter under the League of Nations if the Imperial Government of Great Britain shall avow its unwillingness to continue to extend adequate protection or withhold guarantee of such protection. So then it goes on, the Six Nations also invoke the League of Nations to secure interim relief as follows. For securing from the Dominion of Canada, for unrestricted use by the Six Nations, sufficient funds for the purpose of this application, from the monies of the Six Nations held in trust as foresaid, the balance of which as admitted by the Dominion government approximates $700,000 but which in truly, in truth, largely exceeds that amount. For securing suspension of all aggressive practices by the Dominion of Canada upon the Six Nations people, pending consideration of this application and action taken there and there under. So with all this statement that he, he made, and he never got, like Jolene says, he never got to address that in the League of Nations, so the city had supported him and gave him that venue to raise these issues. And there was a lot of things that the Canadian government had done, you know, besides not allowing him to speak there. 
the Canadian Prime Minister at the time, uh, Mackenzie King, revoked the 1794 Jay Treaty. King also blocked Six Nations access to the Canadian court system from 1927 to 1951. Sir Winston Churchill, under Prime Minister David Lloyd George, denied an audience with the king. He even went to London to try and get an audience with the king, I believe, in 21. Aggressive attitude of the Dominion of Canada and the extension of its laws and authority over us. So they searched his home for liquor. You know, they were coming up with all kinds of excuses to, I guess, put a stop to him. You know, the man never drank, you know. Like I said, in our religion, that's uh, what they call the Gatnigo Hedenos, which is a mind changer, you know. So it doesn't put your mind in that right state. So we abstain from that. Um, they attempted to seize the wampum that the traditional government used at Six Nations. You know, they um, they imposed the um, Indian Act. They ousted our traditional government and imposed their Indian Act Bank Council elected system. Um. When he was in Geneva, the two wampums that he carried, the real ones, they tried to confiscate those and say they were stolen because at that time they had ousted the government there, the traditional government. So he says those wampums don't belong to you anymore. He wouldn't turn them over and um, the police there in Geneva wouldn't help him neither. So <clears throat> upon his return to Turtle Island, like Jolene says, he went um, to Tuscarora Nation. He, he stayed with Chief Clinton Rickard. And it was the fear of coming back into Canada that he would be arrested. So that's why he stayed there. They never passed anything that they would arrest him or um, I guess they were saying um, I found information that he said he was committing treason. I don't know how you can commit treason when you are not a citizen of Canada. You're a citizen of the Haudenosaunee. So, and during that time when he was there, he had taken sick and they denied his family, his children, and his family from crossing that imaginary line to go and see him. They denied he was sick. They denied his medicine men from going over there to help him, to cure him. So, to me, there was a lot of there's a lot more than just denying him the right to address the League of Nations. I think Canada has a lot more to to correct and make right with the Haudenosaunee. I mean, granted, these agreements, these this relationship we have is with the crown. You know, the crown turned supposedly turned this relationship over to Canada, but they never consulted with us. In that relationship, there's two people. So how come how come um, we weren't consulted when they says, "Well, Canada's to deal with you now," you know? Where was our voice in that? Um, you know, and all we want to do is live freely on our own lands. We want that under our own form of government. We have that to practice our own religion, our own laws. That's what we want as a confederacy of nations. You know, to me, we were the original. We came up with that idea, League of Nations. That was us. 
another thing that was, I guess you want to maybe I'll say stolen, you know, from the indigenous peoples, the original peoples. And this is just all things that the Haudenosaunee have been given by Sengwaya Adishno, our creator. And we just want to live our life the way he intended it to be. You know, it's, it's, it is hard because it's, it's two worlds too, right? I've got a day job. I got to work. I got to feed my family. And then there's this job. And it's, it's, it's more than just political too, you know, it's, like I said, the religion where as chiefs were responsible for ensuring our ceremonies get put through, you know, along with our faith keepers, our clan mothers. So it's a lot of work. Um, I think that's why we've got all the help we do. Um So I guess my hope for the common faces from Mother Earth and all those that have gone on ahead of us, that this apology is not just words, and they follow it up with some meaningful dialogue and action with the traditional governments of the Haudenosaunee. Thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much for that discussion uh, or presentation. Um, and now, looking to the future, we have Dr. Cheryl Lightfoot, Chair of the United Nations Expert Mechanism on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and Professor at the University of British Columbia, who will discuss how the implementation of Canada's new embrace of UNDRIP could offer an opportunity for Canada to approach the international presence of Indigenous groups in a more enlightened manner than we did in 1923 when Canada exiled the earlier Chief Tuskahe uh, and cracked down on the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. So if you'll join me in welcoming Dr. Cheryl Lightfoot. Thank you very much for the introduction. And I should say, um, I am not Haudenosaunee. Um, I am Anishinaabe, so I come from lands to the west of Haudenosaunee territory. And it is my pleasure to be here tonight. And I've been asked to speak about the future and looking at the role of the United Nations and the role of indigenous nations. And the relationship, um, and Jolene ended it very well saying, we have much work to do. And so what I wanna do in my 15 minutes tonight is discuss where that journey has been, where we currently are and what is still on the table as we move ahead. So I wanna say this has been a profound journey of indigenous peoples at the United Nations. And it's a journey that's been marked by often subtle, and yet persistent efforts over and over and over again to instigate change. And virtually decades of advocacy for inclusion by indigenous peoples have resulted in some crucial reshapings of indigenous uh, UN institutions to align better with the needs, principles and values of indigenous peoples. So if we go back to the 19, late 1970s and then the working group of the early 1980s and forward, we saw that there were some key rule and procedure changes in the United Nations, which eventually gave birth to such entities as the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues in New York and the Expert Mechanism on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples or MRIP in Geneva. 
And these accomplishments, while notable, underscore a fundamentally broader challenge, which is the limited participation options available to Indigenous peoples since they foot, first set foot in the UN halls in 1977. And only two avenues, and Descalhe mentioned this, have been open to Indigenous peoples in all of those years. Representation by UN member states like Canada, or self-representation, but as non-governmental organizations or NGOs. Now, while many Indigenous peoples do organize themselves as NGOs, a significant number also aspire like Disgahe and those before him, to approach the United Nations as governments, challenging, of course, the appropriateness of NGO status for representatives of indigenous governing bodies. And the distinctive nature of indigenous nations, often at odds with surrounding member states like Canada, renders delegation within the member states illogical. And this dilemma traces all the way back to the 1920s and Descahe's appeal to the League of Nations for speaking time and highlights the persistent absence of an appropriate category for indigenous governing institutions within the UN system. And this practical challenge involved has resulted in scenarios where indigenous peoples are totally absent during discussions and decisions that will directly impact them. And this is a violation of all of the principles embedded in the UN Declaration, which Canada has now committed to. And efforts aimed to render Indigenous peoples' participation in the UN will ultimately be more meaningful, directly impactful, and in harmony with the spirit of the Declaration. The aspiration is immensely clear. The UN needs to make space for Indigenous peoples including an independent status and representation for our nations. And as my very distinguished speakers counterparts tonight have elucidated, indigenous peoples have historically led global change, but yet also serve as one of the most overlooked and underrepresented international actors. So what I wanna to talk to you about is remedying this situation. And the roots of this project towards enhanced participation lie 10 years ago in the June 2013 ALTA conference in Sami territory, the Arctic on the Norwegian side, where indigenous peoples gathered to prepare for the 2014 World Conference on Indigenous Peoples in New York. And the outcome document of the 2013 ALTA conference emphasized recognition based on original free existence inherent sovereignty and the right to self-determination. And the outcome document from that 2013 preparatory conference specifically stated, and I quote, it recommends that the UN recognize indigenous peoples and nations based on our original free existence, inherent sovereignty and the right of self-determination in international law. We call for it said at a minimum, permanent observer status within the UN system, enabling our direct participation through our own governments and parliaments. A year later, at the World Conference in New York, a very important crucial shift occurred, with UN member states making a firm commitment to work on realizing this enhanced participation for Indigenous nations. And then following up on that commitment, the UN General Assembly, yet another year later in 2015, passed a resolution that required the president of the General Assembly to conduct consultations with indigenous peoples organizations, with member states, and with the relevant UN mechanisms on the question of participation. And he was to present a compilation of views which would then form the basis of a new text to be presented to the General Assembly in 2017. So the president of the General Assembly appointed, appointed four expert advisors, the permanent representatives of Finland and Ghana, together with two very well known to us indigenous legal experts, the former special rapporteur James Anaya from North America and Dr. Claire Charters from Aotearoa, New Zealand. 
And the initial, initial consultations they conducted in 2016 and 2017 showed there to be a broad consensus that Indigenous peoples do have the right to participate in discussions and decisions on issues that impact them. And by April 2017, the four advisors had drafted a resolution, which we call the Zero Draft, which was presented again in consultation to member states and indigenous peoples organizations in, at the UN Permanent Forum in 2017. But as many things do, challenges emerged, particularly regarding important issues like venue, modalities, attributes, selection criteria, and selection process. And divergent views between states and indigenous organizations raised concerns about control, discrimination, and potentially undermining of existing rights as articulated in the declaration. And shortly thereafter, a month later in May, 2017, formal negotiations began, but indigenous peoples were no longer in the room. These negotiations resulted in a stalemate in New York revealing conflicting perspectives on recognition, state objection procedures, and compromise attempts. Fear there lingered that requirements discussed by states would undermine hard fought standards that are now articulated in the UN Declaration. And it became, became quite clear to indigenous peoples that the enhanced participation discussion was bringing back many issues and familiar themes that were familiar and a repeat going back as far as the working group of the 1980s. States by and large wanted control, either through an application process or through state recognition of indigenous peoples. And red lines on what is absolutely unacceptable were drawn by both indigenous peoples and member states. And those red lines were in complete and total opposition. And the overwhelming concern at this juncture 2017 was that any of the requirements being discussed by states would undermine completely the existing standards, including the UN declaration that had been fought for 30, 40 years. So the four advisors eventually cleverly forwarded a draft resolution to the president of the General Assembly that would initiate a much slower ongoing process in New York, but would also, just as importantly, avoid a detrimental outcome. In early 2020, representatives of Indigenous peoples met in Quito, Ecuador, to regroup and to discuss what had occurred in New York. And this meeting resulted in an outcome document that included a decision to establish a temporary committee of an indigenous coordinating body to facilitate global cooperation amongst indigenous peoples regarding this process. But as we all know, 2020 had a few other surprises in store for us. And so with the global pandemic, indigenous peoples pressed a big pause on the process recognizing the need to resume this at a face-to-face -face level. So informal interactive hearings in New York were officially postponed due to the pandemic and did not resume until 2023. The process continues, albeit very, very slowly. But the most recent Indigenous Peoples Resolution in New York just days ago stated that consideration of this process should continue. Now in Geneva, we have a parallel process at the Human Rights Council, which at the moment looks to be a slightly more positive direction. So a four day expert workshop was held in Geneva last November, just a year ago, 2022, which explored these tough issues of modality, selection mechanism and criteria for indigenous peoples governing institutions. And the expert mechanism on the rights of indigenous peoples, the body that I currently serve on, maintains its strong support for the process and highlights this issue now each year in our annual meeting in Geneva. And the current fall, the current season's indigenous peoples resolution at the Human Rights Council outlined concrete plans for two two-day intercessional meetings in 2024 and in 2025 to deepen discussions and develop specific ongoing proposals for those tough questions of modalities, selection mechanism, and selection criteria. 
and the most recent Indigenous resolution at the Human Rights Council, passed by consensus, always a relief, um, also signifies progress. So the next significant step in Geneva awaits us in 24 and 25, and this will be a space to watch very closely. So I'd like to conclude my remarks just by saying that as we navigate this very intricate, complex, and sometimes very tedious journey, we do all together envision a day when a true representative of his people, like Descahe, can address the UN as his people's representative. A century is a very long time to wait, but our shared commitment to a more inclusive and just future fuels that perseverance. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Lakefoot. Um, so now if you'll join me in thanking, or in welcoming, uh, Senator Brian Francis, who is the chair of the Senate Committee on Indigenous Peoples and a prominent member of the Mi'kmaq Nation, as he reflects on the relevance of this advocacy for the international representation of Indigenous peoples more broadly. Come on up. <laughs> Well, good evening, everyone. As we would say, it's a pleasure to join you this evening in Ottawa, which is located on the traditional unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation, whose presence reaches back to time immemorial and continues to this day. I want to stand, extend my gratitude to, to the Husadosni Confederacy and its partners for organizing this event and inviting me to share some reflections about the efforts of Indigenous people to gain recognition for their rights. At the core of this discussion is the concept of sovereignty and which is linked to self-determination of the rights of all people to freely exercise control over their lives and their futures. The dominant notion of sovereignty has been deeply influenced by developments that led to the creation of modern nation status, including the Peace of Westphalia, which was signed in 1648. These treaties marked a departure from the dominance of religious authorities and affirmed the independence and autonomy of nation states to exercise control over their defined borders. The concept has evolved particularly in the context of international relations to emphasize the exclusive authority of nation states to govern their territory and populations without interference. The dominant notion of sovereignty imposed by colonial and post-colonial governments deprived generations of indigenous people of the agency to determine our own lives and futures. The result has been a persistent cycle of oppression, marginalization, and discrimination that has had long-standing consequences for our families and communities, including higher rates of poverty, unemployment, homelessness, and other negative economic, social, and health outcomes. It is a painful reality that although our ancestors have called these lands home since time immemorial, shortly after the arrival of the European settlers, our inherent rights and sovereignty were progressively eroded. This process, process can be traced back to the 15th century when the doctrine of discovery was invoked as the legal and moral justification for the dispossession of sovereign indigenous nations, including First Nations. Such lands were deemed terra nullis, meaning belonging to no one. These constructs, which were grounded on the nations of superiority that view indigenous people as fundamentally inferior and uncivilized, continue to inform legal and political decisions that infringe on our rights. Indigenous understandings of sovereignty differ significantly from dominant ones centered on the nation state. To us, sovereignty is not merely a political concept. It encompasses a broader and more interconnected view that often resolves around a long-standing relationship with our lands, cultures, and communities. It is also linked to the right to self-determination and our desire to govern ourselves in accordance with our customs, laws, and traditions. And it is concerned with safeguarding our unique identities and knowledge systems passed down through generations. 
The recognition of indigenous as distinct political entities within the nation state is an ongoing process in Canada. In the current era of reconciliation, there is greater emphasis on considering the perspectives, needs, and aspirations of indigenous peoples. Some communities, for example, have been empowered with the authority to manage internal affairs, such as in the fields of education or child welfare. In addition, progress has been made due to court decisions, constitutional reforms, and historic and modern treaties that have led to increased recognition of Indigenous rights and sovereignty, thus enabling them to shape their present and future. However, some have yet to be fully implemented or honoured. This situation may lead some to question whether Indigenous sovereignty can coexist effectively within nation states. I am far from an expert on these topics and do not pretend to have the answers. But I do know that a shift towards a more just and equitable society that respects and upholds the rights of Indigenous peoples is currently needed in Canada. I also know that Indigenous people have remained resilient, determined, and unwavering in our pursuit of justice and equity. Over the last century, important strides have been made at the international level. One of the earliest examples can be traced to the early 1920s when Houdini Chief Deska, who traveled to Geneva to speak to the League of Nations, the precursor to the United Nations, to present the, to present the case for sovereignty. While he was not allowed to speak then, his mission highlighted the challenges faced by Indigenous peoples in seeking international recognition within the framework of existing nation states. It also laid the groundwork of future Indigenous activists and leaders. Among them is Dr. Wilton Lindachal, a residential school survivor, distinguished lawyer, respected politician, and successful athlete. Since 1977, he attended over 100 meetings as a member of the first Indigenous delegation to the United Nations. He also spent decades working alongside other experts to not only draft the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, but campaign and lobby for his passage. At the time, some nations had concerns that Article 3, which affirms the rights of Indigenous peoples to self-determination, may lead to succession. Article 46 was added to reassure these nations that the declaration would not undermine the territorial integrity or political unity of their states. Although the declaration was then finally adopted in 2007 by the United Nations General Assembly, Canada, as well as Australia, New Zealand, and the United States ultimately voted against its adoption. Even when Canada reversed its position in 2010 and endorsed the declaration, it did so with qualifications emphasizing that it was only aspirational and not legally binding. It was only in 2016 that Canada went on to endorse the full declaration without qualification and committed to its full and effective implementation. Dr. Littlechild advocated for the implementation of the United Nations Declarations on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples in Canada, including during his time as Commissioner of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. The final report released in 2015 called on all levels of government to fully adopt and implement the United Nations Declarations on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples as the framework for reconciliation. At the federal level, the call was answered when the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act came into force in 2021, which among other things, sets out a legislative framework to advocate for the minimum standards necessary for the survival and dignity and well-being of the Indigenous peoples in Canada, including by requiring that federal laws, policies and practices are brought into alignment with these standards. This outcome could have been achieved as early as 2014 and 2016. There was also an opportunity in late 2019 with legislation that had completed all stages in the House of Commons and was in committee at the Senate. However, unfortunately, it died on the order paper when the 42nd Parliament was dissolved. 
In response to calls from Indigenous people and allies urging Canada to immediately, immediately implement the declaration, the federal government introduced Bill C-15 in late 2020. In a speech that I made at the third reading of the United Nations Declarations on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act, I said, the pro progress made in this past decades is not due to the genuine willingness of the federal governments, both conservatives and liberal, to heal the broken relationship with First Nations, Métis and Inuit. It is due to the long and hard fought struggle, both domestically and internationally, to ensure recognition, protection and fulfillment of our inherent rights. I also said it is not lost on me that the transformative, transformative change some of us envision following the, uh, the adoption of the bill will not happen overnight. We know that it is going to take a long time and hard work and we will not always get it right. However, this process cannot be delayed any longer. That was the end of my quote. It is, it is worth remembering that the United Nations Declarations on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples outlines only minimum standards for the survival, dignity, and well-being of Indigenous Peoples. In the context of reconciliation, however, the attainment of the highest attainable standards should be the goal. A recent report by the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples paints a sobering picture. One, where the situation of First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples has changed little in the last decade. As a result, the report calls for urgent action to address the persistent systemic and structural racism, given the pattern of overpromising and under-delivering of consecutive governments. I remain cautiously optimistic. I know that the path ahead requires a genuine commitment to translate the promises of the declaration into tangible changes. And there is frankly no time to waste. We must all do better. There are ultimately many ways in which Canada can advance the recognition of Indigenous sovereignty. As a proud member of the Mi'kmaq Nation and former chief, I am compelled to highlight the importance of honouring historic treaties signed between the British Crown and subsequently by the Canadian government with First Nations. Our ancestors forged agreements known as peace and friendship treaties, not just on parchment, but in the spirit of mutual respect, cooperation and coexistence. In exchange, we were promised the right to hunt, fish and gather in our territory to obtain the necessities of life. In 1999, the Supreme Court of Canada affirmed in a martial decision that we, along with the Wallace Stoic and Passamaquoddy, have a constitutional treaty right. However, the federal government has yet to recognize and implement it fully. As a result, attempts to exercise the treaty right have led to rising tensions and even violence in Atlantic Canada fisheries. The Mi'kmaq have always been stewards and caretakers of the land, in line with the principle of Nedudalum, we have lived in harmony with nature, respect its rhythms, and nurturing its resources. But without recognition of our sovereignty, our ability to safeguard the land, waters, and all our relations is under constant threat. Our quest for sovereignty is not about asserting dominance, but reclaiming our inherent right to self-government, to shape our destiny, and to safeguard the richness of our traditions for generations to come. When it comes to the treaty right, we're not talking, we're not just talking about the importance of having a sustainable livelihood to overcome poverty and other inequities. We're also talking about the arteries that pulse life into our communities, carrying the rich heritage and traditions of our ancestors. Yet the fisheries have become scenes of conflict when our people face seizures, arrests, hostility, and violence simply for exercising rights our ancestors fought to preserve. The Mi'kmaq not, must not be able to only exercise our right to fish and sell our catch, but also to co-manage and govern this resource. However, after more than two decades, Canada does not share this vision. Instead, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans refuses to engage in a serious discussion about, about what a framework for shared decision-making would entail and continues to unilaterally restrict the exercise of this treaty to commercial fisheries which occur within existing seasons and not based on rights, but rather privileges. 
The Mi'kmaq have taken to the international level to bring these issues to light. For example, in response to the various acts of intimidation and violence in the late 2020s, Seminegati First Nation submitted a complaint to the United Nations Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, alleging a lack of response from the authorities in Canada. In response from August 2022, the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination made note of the report issued by the Senate Committee on Fisheries and Oceans, of which I am a member, in a report titled Peace on the Water, Advancing the Full Implementation of the Mi'kmaq, Holistoeg, and Passamaquoddy Rights-Based Fisheries, issued in July 2022. The Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination further called on Canada to outline the measures it adopted to respond, protect, and advance the rights of the Mi'kmaq in relation to the fisheries in reference to not only concerns and recommendations of the Senate Committee on Fisheries and Oceans, but also its international obligations. While this is an important acknowledgement of the failure of Canada to live up to its international reputation as a champion of human rights, the reality is that little has changed on the ground for the Mi'kmaq, which speaks to the limits of the United Nations when states do not comply. It is incredibly troubling for the Mi'kmaq that Canada refuses to uphold not only the ruling of the highest court in the land, but, uh, but live up to the promises of the United Nations declarations on the rights of Indigenous peoples and other instruments. This failure not only fuels distrust, anger, and fear, but keeps our people and communities in a state of socioeconomic disadvantage. Canada needs to embrace Indigenous sovereignty, not as an abstract notion, but as a tangible and recognized aspect of legal and political discourse. discourse. All governments and sectors of society must champion the right to self-determination, ensuring that Indigenous communities have the tools, resources, and authority to shape our destinies in line with our cultural values and aspirations. The coexistence of, this, of state sovereignty and Indigenous sovereignty is not a clash, but an opportunity, an opportunity for mutual respect, collaboration, and shared prosperity. It requires acknowledgement, not assimilation, understanding, not imposition. Ulalan, which is thank you in Mi'kmaq for all your time and your attention this evening, and let's continue to walk together in this journey towards a more equitable and harmonious future. Thank you, Ulalio. Thank you very much for that. Um, so I'm now going to invite all of our speakers up for a panel where we're going to conduct a QA. and um, I'm going to turn on the mics and we'll all take a seat and I will hand out the mics and then we'll just move them along as we have received the questions. So if you please join me up here. There we go. Is it working? I just speak loudly. Um, so do we, do we have any questions? If you want to raise your hand, I will then point, um, and please ask your question and then direct it to whoever or each individual, uh, as a collective. Um, do we have anyone that would like to ask the first question? Yes. Perspective and the population of the 
I don't, I don't know if we have population numbers. Um, we have communities, you know, all over America, um, Canada. I guess the furthest one west would be uh, Oneidas in Green Bay, Wisconsin. Um, the furthest south would be in Oklahoma, where there is uh, Seneca and Kyogas down there. Um, we have the Onondaga Nation, just south of Syracuse, New York. We have uh, Oneida Territory just to the east of Onondaga and east of there. Um, there was a community started there uh, with Tom Porter, and that's a Mohawk community. And then we go back to the west of Onondaga. We've got, we are currently establishing the Cayuga Nation territory on the homelands. Um, and then we've got Tanawanda Senecas, uh, and then the Tuscarora Nation over uh, Tanawanda Nation. There's Senecas there over by Akron. Uh, we got Tuscarora that's over near Lewiston. Um, south of there, we have two communities. Uh, territories um, at Cataraugus and Salamanca. So that's the U.S. side. Um, we got Oneidas in London, on Ontario. Then the Grand River Reserve, which is uh, probably the largest population and largest land base. Um, Going east, uh, you'd have Tyndanaga, which is Mohawks. Grand River, by the way, has all uh, six nations present there. Um, Tyndanaga Mohawks. Then you have Akwesasne Mohawks. That's near Cornwall, uh, Hogansburg, St. Regis, that whole area. And that's, that's just uh, a whole other issue there. Uh, and then you go further east, you got Kahnawaga, that's just uh, other side of the river of Montreal. And north of them, you have um, Ganasadagi. Um, oh, then coming back west, you'd have the Wata Reserve, which is Mohawk too. But population wise, um, that I wouldn't know. Um, we've never participated in any census or anything, so we don't have any information like that. Um, we've always been encouraged not to participate in that because it's a Canadian census and we don't consider ourselves Canadian. So, and to say, to put a number on it, you know, we, we really don't know, you know, what our population is. It's just, there's a lot of us. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Um, I believe I saw another question. Yes, go ahead. Um, so I'm entirely new to Canada. I'm here as a student, um, but I'm, I'm learning about the implementation of the system. My question was um, as an international student or other new students to Canada, um, what role do you think? Um, what role do you think um, we can play in um, furthering um, the cause or the recognition of the rights and sovereignty of the indigenous peoples across our country? So, who feels? Like, <laughs> <laughs> so, wondering what you feel. So, I'll start with it too. I mean, it, it's like what the Skahe Levi general um, mentioned in his last address on the radio is that. The population is the one that um, elects these leaders for the Canadian government, for the U.S. government. So you have the right to 
influence them. And I think that's one thing that he he pushed for was that that's your responsibility to that's your system. That's that two row, you know, where we're in our canoe, the the Hudino Shoni, and then the other purple row is the non-native in their sail, you know. So we don't interfere in their sailboat. They don't interfere in our canoe. And I think that's the only thing that I could say is that, you know, that's your system or that's the system for the non-native. That's how you influence um, that government is how you vote. And I guess the only thing with their so-called de democracy is, you know, the, the people really don't have a say after they elect them in, right? You know? They, that person could go off and do whatever they dang well please, right? I mean, they don't have to listen to the people. You know, in our system, we have to. We listen to the people, but to the point where, I guess, if it goes against our beliefs that we were given by Sanguaya Adiso, if it goes against our great law, and our guy wheel, our handsome light code on how we're supposed to be, then that's what we base our decisions on. And we base it on the common faces from Mother Earth. You know, a lot of people say seven generations, but it's not even at seven generations. It's the common faces that I have to make my decision on how it's going to affect them, you know. So I'm kind of rambling on now, but I'll pass it on to somebody else. Um, would anyone else like to answer a question as well? Thank you for the question. And I think your being here is that first step in that um, I deal with students from all over the world at Cornell. And when they take a class of mine, I think that that is their uh, beginning awareness of uh, the global condition of indigeneity. And, and so I think it's a, a time right now where uh, I think young people like yourself are recognizing that uh, we need to think beyond uh, the recognition of settler states. And we need to understand the history and the formation of settler states as an ongoing global condition of oppression and we have to think beyond it. And I think recognizing indigenous peoples, not only uh, in this hemisphere, but recognizing the multiplicity of it globally becomes, I think, all of our responsibilities. And so I think in the 21st century, we're, we're moving towards a different understanding and formation of both nation and governance. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I think, in, in our interest of time, we'll move on to the next question. Um, oh. Um, thank you very much. I'm Andrew Shardanian from the uh, Human Rights Center at the University of Ottawa. And I'm very honored to be with you all today. I have a question um, that comes from the class I'm teaching right now on political anthropology at Concordia. And with, uh, our students together, we read in our seminar, Audra Simpson's Mohawk in that wonderful book, she um, comes up with this very powerful concept of nested sovereignties. At the same time, she also talks about refusal. And I, um, I wanted to hear in this history of this 100-year experience that we are focusing the discussion on today, um, what, how you see those two dynamics working together, because on some level, the international system, the United Nations system, like the League of Nations, our entire construct here depends on the state, as this, as you mentioned, Chief, uh, uh, and uh, as the Senator also mentioned, uh, you know, uh, Westphalia, as a, as a very tight billiard ball, right, that's meant to knock into other billiard balls, uh, and its interests get dis disrupted. So I, 
I was wondering if you could help us kind of see a path to the way we can negotiate those two tensions. I'm getting a cue that that comes to me. <laughs> Thank you very much for the question. Um, and I appreciate uh, Professor Simpson's book very much. Um, and she talks about um, what's going on on the border um, and the, the cross border. Well, actually, as it was said, the border crossed the Haudenosaunee, not the other way around. Um, and so her re her description of refusal is a very poignant, um, very il beautifully illustrated um, example of the refusal to accept um, state citizenship and state sovereignty by being Haudenosaunee and enacting that on a daily lived basis. And that necessarily means, um, and we, we there are a variety of terms that we can use, nested sovereignty, plural sovereignties, multiple sovereignties, or we can come up with future terms that may even get at it better. Um, so this is something we're all learning and developing language in order to get at these concepts, that the world is not actually neatly divided up into territorially bounded nation states. The world is full of complexity and gray area and nuance, and indigenous peoples are just part of that conversation, but in my view, are actually some of the leaders in that conversation, pushing for that complexity and acceptance of that complexity. And in my experience and academic work, I argue very strongly that the lessons that we make and the moves that we make, whether it's at the United Nations or on the ground at the border, are pushing back against all of those boundaries that aren't really that firm if we're honest about it. So the Haudenosaunee passport, which there was a beautiful picture in Jolene's presentation, is a case in point. That passport does not represent a bounded territorial nation state in the Westphalian conventional sense. And yet, these fine folks travel on it routinely. They get visas, they travel to Switzerland, they travel to Mexico um, on that passport. That challenges all of the primary assumptions about state centrism in ways that um, are kind of mind blowing if you're stuck into that construction. So I think it encourages us to think broader, think deeper, think in more complex nuanced ways. And my hope would be that if we can help that conversation as indigenous peoples, that might have implications for other parts of the world that aren't quite so neat and clean. Thank you. One more question, and then we'll allow for questions during the networking portion of the rest of the evening. Some more intimate one-on-one -on -one questions. Um, so, do we have do we have any other questions? Oh, come on, give me one more. <laughs> ah, yes, perfect. Thank you. So, you spoke to. Um, I have really bad memories. I'm sorry, but I remember hearing about working down with other. Asian people. So I'm wondering, like, focusing on the future and the present, um, what would you say um, is your hope for this kind of cooperation? And what do you hope that you can maybe learn from each other? I believe, if I'm if I'm correct, is that in reference to Dr. Ricard's presentation, where it was Ireland, Panama? Uh, no, that's perfect. I, I think. Oh, I, I thank you for the question. I think we could all address it in a number of different ways. Uh, at present, uh, within uh, the arts, for instance. Uh, there's uh, a strong alliance of comparative analysis between uh, indigenous communities in Aotearoa, New Zealand, Australia, uh, the Sami network, um, uh, an emergence of an understanding of how indigeneity is defined in Africa. Uh, there's a really robust discussion going on in the Pacific Rim. 
Uh, there's uh, alliances built with uh, Indigenous Taiwanese as well as Indigenous peoples in the Americas. In my experience, uh, perhaps the least evolved discussion is actually the discussion between Indigenous peoples in North America and Indigenous peoples in Central and South America. And so I think in each of our areas, there's different um, awarenesses of uh, how we are navigating um, these uh, state uh, and continuously colonial relationships while establishing new networks between each other. And so uh, I think it's a really exciting time, yet it's a, a, an incredibly complex time. And one of the things that I've been observing lately is that if as citizens of whatever uh, state or community or nation we're part of, if we all understood more deeply the history and process of coloniality, I think that we would be having a very different discussion today in the world. And so part of this is I think about uh, awareness. And I guess I do take uh, Cheryl's comment that indigenous peoples are at the leading edge of this not just politically, but also in the concerns around the environment. And when you bring these two things together, I think that um, you can't ignore uh, the way in which we observe and move in the world. I'd just like to add to that too. Um, I guess indigenous peoples or original peoples um, were we all have that same thinking of of the natural world and protecting it and speaking for that. Um, but I don't think the colonial governments cannot use a cookie cutter and think that what's going to apply to the Haudenosaunee is going to apply for the next nation, you know. And I think that's what makes it difficult, you know, especially for the Haudenosaunee. We have that treaty relationship with the crown, right? And it's not with Canada. Um, I think any treaties that Canada has as their government is those numbered ones. And it's mostly, um, I guess, out west, you know, and so... I just don't think that they can just come up with one thing and say, this is what's going to work for all the nations. You know, it's not a cookie cutter solution. We can't be lumped into uh, a one boat, I guess, you know, we're all, we're all original peoples. And like I said, we all have that, knowledge of the natural world and I think that's probably pretty much where it stops I think so I think that's all I'd like to add okay uh, well thank you everyone um, I'm going to invite the CIC president of the Ottawa branch to come up and thank everyone um, but thank you all for your time and for your questions that was thank lovely you. On behalf of the branch, I would like to thank you all. Thank you all for taking the time to come over and uh, allow us to learn from you. The presentation was very informative. And as uh, it was mentioned, the new generation of Canadians are interested to learn more about the history, especially the history of the history. I know this because I have two children that are very involved in this process and would like to learn more. In addition, as a Canadian of Persian heritage, I'm also very honored to learn about history and our lives. These events are only possible with the support that we get from you as members of the CIC. And if you have not renewed your membership, please do take the time to renew your membership. You also have generous supporters, and I would like to begin by thanking Sandra, Adonai Foundation, and the Brown Foundation, 
and also our gracious hosts who gave us the opportunity to be here and having this conversation. So thank you all. But one thing that I would like to take the moment to say here is that it is an honor to have His Excellency, the former Ambassador, Canadian Ambassador, Ben Russell. He has been the president of CIC for the last few years, and under his leadership, we have achieved great milestones. Foreign policy by Canadians, global ambitious projects. These are just a few of things that under his leadership we have been able to achieve. And I'm very sad to hear that his contract with the CIC will be concluded soon, but we will always remember you as a pioneer in terms of the ideas that you brought to this table. So please join me in a round of applause.